Hello and welcome to the Big Ideas Art Studio. My name is Nicole and if you don't know by now, I am a full choice elementary art teacher embracing the teaching for artistic behavior philosophy. So in this video, I want to talk about managing student artwork. If you are thinking about transitioning to choice, you're probably wondering how does one manage all of the different types of artwork that can be created in one period? Or if you already are a choice teacher, maybe you're wondering how you can enhance your practice. So the first thing I want to talk about is 2D storage. So artworks that are flat and dry go in a folder. So I have a class folder um, that is made out of 12 by 18 laminated pieces of construction paper. So I laminate two of those pieces of construction paper together, cut them out, and fold them over in half. So I have one of those folders for each of my classes, and those folders are stored in drawers. Now the drawers aren't necessary. I'm lucky that I do have storage for those folders. Otherwise, if you don't have the storage to store those folders, you can just keep all of the folders together in one location and when the class comes, get out the specific folder for that class. So from there, we learn about what do we do if our artwork is wet. So if we have a painting or a collage that's wet with glue, where do we put it? So obviously the drying rack is the solution to that. Now I use color-coded messy mats for my drying rack to make sure that I know exactly where each artwork on the drying rack belongs. So my first class of the day is my 915 class. They are my red messy mat. My second class is my orange. My third class of the day is yellow and so on. That way when I come in the next day and I start pulling artwork off of the mess or off of the drying rack, all I have to do is look at the color and I know that all of the red artworks belong to my 915 class from the previous day. So from there I take those artworks and I put them in that 2D folder. So, 3D storage. I'm really lucky that I have really tall, spacious cabinets, um, and it just so happens that I have 25 shelves in those cabinets, so five per cabinet, five cabinets, five shelves. So I'm really lucky that I have that space. However, it's not totally necessary to have a lot of space in order to store 3D artwork. So when I was on a cart, I actually used boxes to store uh, 3D artwork. So copy paper boxes from your copy room, those huge boxes, those actually work really well for storing artwork. And if you're really tight on space, you can even have that artwork um, that box perhaps stored in a classroom if you're willing to talk with classroom teachers. So you can even give a student a job. So each class can have a sculpture person who is in charge of bringing that copy paper box to and from their classroom. So copy paper boxes work great for 3D storage if you don't have the cabinet space or the storage space, but regardless of how you're storing 3D art, you really wanna make sure that you are managing size, the sculpture size. So kids love building and they will build big if you let them. So make sure that you have a size tester somewhere in your art room to help manage the size of your artworks. So the next thing you need to think about is where are you going to store 3D artwork that's wet with glue or paint or even paper mache perhaps. So for me, I used to have some areas in the art room where I was able to let those, those wet artworks dry. Now with our COVID situation and with desks spread out throughout the room, I don't have that space. So what I've been doing is using those messy mats again. So what I have my kiddos do, if they have a sculpture that needs to dry, they grab their appropriate color messy mat, they put it in the hallway up against the wall, and then they put their artwork on their messy mat. So again, all I have to do is when I come in the next day, I grab artwork from the messy mats, look at the color, and then put it on the appropriate shelf in my cabinets. So I know in the hallway isn't ideal, but you'd be surprised at how respectful kiddos are of other kiddos' artwork. When you give them the freedom to create their own authentic art, they suddenly start to respect other kids' artwork way more. Now that's not to say that you shouldn't have a conversation with them about how to respect artwork in the hallway, but you will be surprised at how respectful they can be of artwork drying in the hallway. So if that's something that works for you, awesome. If it's not, perhaps you have color-coded areas in your classroom that align with those messy mat colors. Maybe you have a red area for the red class, maybe you have a green area for the green class, and so on. So the next thing to think about is clay, if you have that option. So I have a copy paper box lid, one box lid for each class, and on that box lid, there is a room number, their room number, and also a letter of the alphabet. So each one of my classes is given a class code, and that's just 
a letter of the alphabet. So I, that works really well for me because I have 25-ish classes on average. In the past, I have had more than that. And when I go over 25, then I just double up a letter. So then I have the double A class and the double B class. And the reason I give my classes a letter code is because I use letter stamps to identify artwork. So when a kid was done with their clay artwork, they bring it to the cook me cart and put it in the appropriate box lid, their class box lid. And at the end of class, while they're cleaning up, I quickly take their code. So let's say it's the B class. I take the letter B stamp that I have from my cart and I quickly stamp all of the artworks with the letter B. That way it makes loading and unloading the kiln very, very easy. I don't have to worry about um, room numbers. I don't have to worry about the kids writing on the bottom of their artwork um, and having to decipher messy handwriting. All I have to do is look for that letter stamp and I know exactly where I need to put it. So as far as names go, I've tried in the past um, allowing the kids to not put their name on it. I've tried having them put their name on their clay artwork and most recently what's been working is I just have them put their name on a little piece of scrap paper that I keep on the cook me card, a little box of scrap papers that they can grab and I have them write their name on that scrap paper and put it with their clay artwork and then I just quickly put initials on the clay artwork for them because I find their handwriting really hard to read and it's shocking that they also find their handwriting hard to read. I was sure that at least if they wrote their name, they'd be able to figure it out, but that's not always the case. And I talk more about art numbers in another one of my videos and I will link it in the description. So I purchased some number stamps from Amazon. I'm pretty sure they're for leather working. I'm not really sure, but I have number stamps and I'm going to try to see if the kiddos can stamp their art number on the bottom of their clay artworks. So this is probably something that I would monitor or maybe have a responsible kiddo monitor at the end of class just to make sure that the, those stamps aren't getting lost because they are pretty tiny. I will report back and let you know if that works or not. Worst case scenario is they are writing their name on a piece of paper and I am quickly um, putting initials on the bottom of artwork. So those are my routines for each type of artwork that is created in my classroom. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment in the section below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Otherwise, thank you for being here. Make sure to like and subscribe and I will see you next time. Bye.